43, the boiling temperature of water is lower at high elevations than at sea level. This is true because as your elevation increases, so as your elevation increases, as you go higher and higher, say climb a mountain, your air pressure, your atmospheric pressure decreases, right? The air gets thinner as you get higher and higher and higher. And the key insight is that when vapor pressure of a liquid equals the air pressure, the atmospheric pressure, that's when boiling occurs. So if you are, and another thing, vapor pressure is dependent on temperature. So eventually when you heat a, let's say water up to a high enough temperature, its vapor pressure increases with that increase in temperature. And eventually your vapor pressure at 100 degrees Celsius equals the atmospheric pressure. And that's what boiling happens. But if you lower the atmospheric pressure, your vapor pressure doesn't need to get as high, which means you don't need to raise the temperature as much. The boiling point will be lower. So yes, this is a true statement. You can either remember this as a factoid, or if you understand that relationship between vapor pressure, air pressure, temperature, boiling point, that you know is a little bit more complicated. But if you get that, great. If not, just know this is a fact. The higher you go up in elevation, the lower the boiling point. Atmospheric pressure is lower at high elevations than at sea level. That's also true. And so this is a CE. This explains why the boiling point decreases because atmospheric or air pressure is lower at those high elevations. So your vapor pressure doesn't need to get as high. And so the boiling point is not as high in terms of temperature. So 43 is true, true CE. And so that would be A. So we've got an element X. Can we expect it to form the compound H2X? Well, we look at its configuration and we see that it's basically, we can actually find the exact element this is. If we look in the table, 2, 4, 10, 12, 16 electrons, that corresponds to sulfur, which makes sense because sulfur has two valence, or has two, uh, is two electrons short of a full shell, as is this 3P4. So this is sulfur that can typically form H2S because those two S electrons on the H are shared with the S to give it that full shell. And so S just like O makes two bonds and an analog to this in that group would be H2O. But here we've got S, same kind of compound though, H2S. And so two additional electrons fill the valence shell of an element with outer electron configurations, three S2, three P4. Um, so yeah, this would be basically the same idea, right? Yes, this bonding occurs because these two electrons from each one from each of the hydrogens uh, is shared with the S and therefore becomes 3P6. So you get those two additional electrons filling that valence shell. And so this would be true. So true and true. And then this is a CE. This explains it. So yet again, we get choice A. The heat of vaporization of water and the heat of fusion of water are numerically, oops, I cut this off. I think, let me just double check what that was supposed to say. Numerically different. So let me write that in, different. This is true. In fact, the heat of vaporization of water is higher than the heat of fusion of water. It requires more energy to vaporize a given mass of liquid than it does to melt a given mass or to go from solid to liquid or liquid to solid. Uh, you need more energy to make that liquid to gas or gas to liquid phase, phase change. So that is true. They're different. When water freezes or vaporizes, its chemical composition remains unchanged. Also true, when you're changing the state, you're not changing the chemistry. You're not changing the formula or the, the uh, chemical structure of water at all. You're just changing its physical structure, its physical state. So phase changes are physical changes and therefore they don't affect the chemical composition. So that's true, but this doesn't explain the second. This being true doesn't explain why the first statement is true. They're just two true facts that are unrelated. So this is just going to be true, true, which means we get B. When a piece of zinc is dropped into one molar copper sulfate, metallic copper appears. This one's pretty hard because you need to, again, it's in the factoid sheet. There's an activity series there. Whether you actually have to memorize that for more recent versions of this test is unclear. I mean, if you have the time and the energy, yeah, memorizing it or at least learning it pretty well would be useful. But if you don't, it is, I think, useful to know that zinc is more active than copper. So in this scenario, we're going to have a reaction of that zinc metal plus the copper sulfate going to 
copper metal plus zinc sulfate. So we get the single replacement reaction because zinc is more active than copper. So it essentially jumps in here, kicks out the copper from that compound, copper gets reduced to copper metal, zinc gets oxidized to zinc two plus or zinc plus two. And so we have a redox reaction here. So this definitely happens because zinc is more active. If zinc were not more active, if zinc were lower in the activity series or lower in the table that shows which gets oxidized, then this would not happen. But in this case it does, so that's true. Zinc is more readily oxidized than co copper. That's another way of saying it's more active. And so again, we get a true, true CE because the fact that it's more readily oxidized is why this is gonna come in be oxidized and then reduce copper in the process because zinc would much rather be oxidized in this scenario than copper. So we get true, true, this is a CE. And so again, we get choice A.